Welcome to Nailing It Down, where I answer your questions. Well, my patrons' questions, anyway. For those who used to watch my show over on Zero Books, Theorizing with a Hammer, it had a simple purpose, which was explainers on the overlaps between continental and particularly Marxist critical theory and more traditional forms of philosophy. And I would set out to do brief 10 to 30 minute videos explaining the differences um, between conceptions of, say, reification, um, what critical theory was, how should you argue and think, etc. You know, inspired by, you know, the four horsemen of modernity, it really was an exercise in basic critical theory literacy, which was the aim of the Zero Books channel. Now, there are a lot of problems with this format. People often would miss episodes in a series and not know what was going on or how one thing related to the other. Furthermore, people would want either more detail than a 15-minute explainer could give you, even though I was doing it in a series, or less detail than I would like because they wanted something that they could use for organizing, whatever they meant by that, um, or political agitation, whatever they meant by that. However, it was a fairly popular format on the channel, at least with some viewers over there at um, Zero when it was under the auspices of John Hunt Publishing when Doug Lane was their publisher. However, the, the series was canceled because of uh, hostile feedback um, in the comments that I didn't want to deal with, and because Zero, before it was uh, public, uh, bought, was going in a different direction um, than those explainers. But there was a lot of demand for me to bring short explainers back. And I wanted to give another benefit to my Patreon supporters, my patrons, um, at all levels, all of the con, uh, all of the conate, as I like to call them. Um, and so I am doing short 10 to 30 minute videos that were in the format of talking head here with not much production, but I'm going to answer one question in detail, I'm going to give a link uh, list in the show notes, and I will give my Patreons um, a reading list to the best of my ability. And so I'm going to answer one of my patrons' first questions. Now, first, I'm going to talk about how I select these questions for my patrons. One, you have to be a patron. If I run out of patron questions, which I kind of doubt I ever will, then I will take questions from the comments. And if I see a question that overlaps in both the comments and the patrons, I'm going to do those first because obviously that's going to be something everybody was going to like. Secondly, unlike theorizing with a hammer, these are not generated by me and they're not limited in what they will do with some exceptions. One, if you ask me to go into a very specific detail of a anthropological, historical, or theoretical work that most people aren't familiar with, I will answer that question in the Patreon in writing. I won't answer it here because I would have to do probably five to ten videos before we get to that point um, to fully be able to answer your question. So think about something when you're asking me a question as a patron that's going to be of use to a broad sample of people where we can do one, two, or three short videos explaining the concepts, not where I have to go in and explain many, many things. Save that for a patron-only Q&A where I can answer you or accept the answer in the patron channel. But I got a, a question that I thought did meet my criterion, which is broad can be answered simply um, in a 10 to 15 minute video and actually explains a lot of the concepts that I'm getting on in my rant videos, in my Q and A's, etc., and that was um, specifically, what is the difference between history 
in historiography. Now I'm gonna add a few other concepts into this question. I'm gonna go into meta history. I'm going to go into micro history. I'm gonna go into some general shifts in historical paradigms. But it was in response to what I said over and over and over again in many shows, both here and in uh, Mortal Science and in Pop the Left, the other two shows I do and used to do, respectively, um, that most critical theorists and most Marxists confuse history and historiography. And even if I'm really being specific, they confuse history and meta-history. But let's get into what historiography is first. So what is history? Well, history comes from the word for story. You know, in, in, in Romance languages, this, this is actually very clear. Historia, um, you know, is both story and history. So history is a narrative of past events. Now, there are many methodologies for writing that narrative, whether they be statistical, which is one we don't often talk about, but is clearly the work of someone like Peter Tertian. Um, although what he's engaged in, properly speaking, is sort of a, his, a mathematical, statistical, meta-historical theory that we will call, or he calls, cleodynamics. And again, we need to get back to what meta-history is in a second. Um, it could be archaeological, and, and the majority of um, histories were primary source um, narratives recounted and critically examined against each other. That's how his theory was traditionally done until probably the 19th century when we started using archaeology, and then we started developing other um, historical methodologies due to innovations in science and archaeology and the beginnings of, even though it was colonial, anthropology, etc. Now, history is just the events of the past told in a narrative format. That narrative could even be, as I said earlier, a mathematical narrative, which, you know, blows your mind. But what, it, what, what narrative means is just a story of events constrained with those events. Historiography, however, is primarily the history of histories, or the history of how history is created, the frameworks that are used to talk about history, such as how we do periodization, how we decide what is a valid source, how you compare primary and secondary sources, Etc. So historiography is something every historian has to engage in, and critical historiography is the critical engagement with understanding the way history was constructed in the past. It is thus the history of histories, or to use a very vulgar metaphor, history of sex, historiography is the history of pornography. <laughs> so you can see where we're going here. But meta history is even more fascinating. Arguably, meta history is a branch or subset of historiography, although you could argue otherwise, because you could have a meta history not based on the way an understanding, a historical understanding of the way history has been constructed. Um, when your average Marxist uses the term, what they mean is, you know, periodizations, modes, and relations of production. You heard this jargon that has very specific meaning in Marxism and talks about very broad and very big concepts that we use to generate understandings of politics, economics, culture, in certain historical time periods based on the material conditions. And material conditions are relations of production, are relations of how we reproduce social life. You might hear this 
in modern theory of social reproduction theory. And then modes of production are the formalization and abstractions of how we do that. So a mode of production is like a slave society and antique culture. Now, modes of production are vaguer the further you go back in time. Um, and this has caught a lot of controversy in like very simple stage theories of history um, are, are modes of history. But all none of that is actually history itself. The modalities, the narratives of dialectics, all these choices where we talk about the meaning are the abstract formations that we can deduce from history are properly speaking meta-historical. So when we talk about, say, historical materialism, a historical materialist text is a philosophy of history, or it is a meta-history, um, a his, you know, a way of contextualizing and understanding historical events. And all histories, all narratives have one even implicitly. All right. Now, that's not something that's obvious until you've studied history for a long time, because frameworks really do matter. As it's often said, and I'm going to do a video on this eventually, the map is not the terrain and the terrain is not the map. All right. The meta history and the historical events have separate meanings. We also might refer to meta history as micro history, which is like when you're trying to look through tons of historical data and deduce or abduce laws of motion. All right. Now, Modern historians, by and large, don't do this. And if they do do it, someone like Peter Turchin and Cleo Dynamics, for example, it is often now relegated to sociology or anthropology um, or, but properly speaking, a lot of it is meta-historical analysis. There's also micro-history. Micro-history emerges from conflicts in historiography about over-concluding from you know, meta history about modes of production or generalizations from the historical past that were presented as science. Micro history focus on very small narratives, limits the scope of those narratives, and uses often exceptions to the rule to broaden out historical discussions. You can see this in primarily the work of someone like Carlo Ginsberg. Um, uh, Italian historian who's famous for writing the book, The Cheese and the Worms. Properly speaking, um, microhistory has become more in vogue as is limiting your conceptions to things that are factual. Um, if you draw conclusions and frameworks, it tends to be uh, in a new historical kind of method, which, again, we can talk about what that means, but where you kind of assume that there's a, a worldview or a general epistemology or whatever that can be discovered and that it's fairly discreet. Um, and then you talk about discrete events. There's also a sense now in which... Um, the meaning of periodizations or a huge difference in conceptions of human life are uh, ignored. So there's another almost opposed trend in contemporary history to talk about, say, markets as if markets work the same way back a thousand years. So to look for commonalities between societies as opposed to differences or distinguishing features. Um, these are meta-historical questions and historiographic questions. All right. Now, Marxist, Marxist historiography, for example, based on some key ideas in Marx, is that there might be a consistent human subject that is biological, and but we can't know it. So it's not that there is no human nature. It's that knowing human nature is functionally impossible because we will always assume that the limits on our current being are transhistorical. So what does that mean, right? Um, that means that 
we can't know what human nature is any more than we can know the nature of a dog by setting a dog in captivity or the example historically is the nature of a wolf by studying wolves in captivity we have mischaracterized um lupine society <laughs> which you know is a thing by over deducing behavior of alpha beta omega wolves off of how wolves act in captivity well when you studied wolves in the wild those patterns were very different. So what's wolf nature? Well, probably the one that more naturally occurs, right? But literally, there's a rhyming in the name. But there is a sense in which the, the, the nature of wolves in captivity is what was described. Those are generalizable trends that develop probabilistically. Right. Well, how does this affect history? Well, our understanding of history and what people do and the historical constraints, their material constraints, to use uh, Marxist terminology, is going to be based on what we assume is important. And what we assume is important is going to be based on two things, our meta-historical frameworks like, and our historiographic assumptions. So how do we think history has been generated in the past as an uh, artifact? Of knowledge, and I'm not going to say science here because that's a controversial statement, but um, because narratives and science tend to be at odds in our modern perceptions of both. But how have we generated knowledge in the past about historical events? What have they meant? All right. Um, and then what have our new frameworks say about those things now and what they're likely to do in the future? In the middle of the 20th century, metahistorical theories of laws of motion and historical laws fell out of favor in academia. Um, Marx pushes against Marxism was a big part of it, but also pushes against Whiggish historians, which is not Marxist, uh, you know, clear liberal developmentalist phases where every society goes through this stage and this stage and this stage and this stage and a clear evolutionary pattern. Um, which is a misunderstanding of the evolution of biology, if we're honest, um, going further and further in history, right? So part of it was a rejection of things like um, Wage historical laws, things that, things that generate ideas like Isaac Asimov's, you know, uh, foundation trilogy, right? You, you, you see these big, like, laws of history, you know, Great man theory is actually one of these. Um, the both dialectical and historical materialism come out of Marxism and are kind of like this. Uh, uh, historical physics um, are the idea of like history operates like physics operates and determine matters that are clearly deterministic, which is a problem because physics doesn't operate that way as we understand it now, even though Newtonian mechanics is more or less accurate. Um, you can see how this became it came out of favor outside of uh, Marxist theory, which increasingly um, is accepted as a valid historiographic school, even by conservatives in in uh, most history departments. Um, history became much more localized, much less conceptualized and you will constantly hear debates over terminology if you read scholarly you know historical debates about like the validity of feudalism as a category should we really call it manoralism um blah 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 and, like what are the criterion so a lot of the debates actually in history right now are also about meta history and historiography as much as they are about the, the specific nature of the events I hope you find this clarifying. There's a lot of concepts in here, and I'm going to come back in another couple of videos like this and explain some of these more and try to answer a few other questions that have been asked. But this is a good place to start. So because so much of what I do as a educator, um, even though my day job is actually educating in languages and modern, lang you know, teaching people English and literature and things like that, um, and designing curriculum uh, that does that, historical approaches are actually it's super important to that as well. And what I've done as a podcaster has largely been focused on theory and history with an emphasis more on history than 
theory and if we're completely honest more on getting sound history uh meta historical principles and historiographic understandings into the way we talk about the historical past so that we when we make political um social cultural you know decisions now that we have a good framework for understanding the past because it will help us develop more useful frameworks in the future it is not that those who don't know history are doomed to repeat it because well plenty of people know history and still repeat it and also you don't really repeat history it just kind of rhymes it seems like things repeat in a spiral where small contextual things have changed and you know uh things are are different and yet they're also moving in patterns that we can see that are similar but um i think understanding that history the facts and narratives we tell about the events of the past is different from either a the understandings that people have used to bring that in the past and and studying that aka historiography um, our meta history, our you know philosophies of history, our philosophies of history of science, etc. Um, and I'm going to use meta history for all that, which is the concepts, frameworks, periodizations, and understandings that we bring to uh, the data or the narratives of history to make them meaningful and parsable. All right, I hope you find this interesting. Thank you. And you're going to find a bunch of links, some of which are just things that require a subscription, but still uh, in the show notes to help you understand this. Have.